What I'd like everyone to think about is a time where you felt most competent in your daily work, that you felt most trusted and had a lot of space to make your own choices, where you felt like the work you were doing was contributing to something meaningful. Um, think about basically the time where you most enjoyed your work. I'm ready to bet that this was also the time where you had one of the best managers you've ever had. I know my managers always had a huge impact on my motivation, my performance, and also my health. So when I first became someone else's manager for the first time years ago, um, I took it really seriously. Um, as a great responsibility and with great professionalism, I completely freaked out. <laughs> so I seek guidance. What do you do to become a good manager? Um, and I started looking for inspiration in books and articles and also the scientific literature on motivation. And what I've learned about motivation has completely changed how, about, how I think about this um, in terms of my own motivation, but also the motivation of my teams. And I absolutely love teams. Teams are the best. This delicate ensemble of artists, designers, researchers, engineers coming together, pulling their energy and, and talent um, in the service of something that is bigger than themselves. Teams are really the best. And for the last 10 years, uh, producing AAA games, but also working on interactive experiences in the consumer robotics, and today, using video games to advance the state of the art in artificial intelligence, I've been passionate about understanding what makes a great team. The topic I want to explore today with you is human motivation, what drives us to act. I've came across an interesting research from Bart, DC, and Ryan, studies they'd done in, 19, in 2004, where they explored the individual differences, um, the people on the team and how that can impact the motivation of them as individuals, but also the group, compared to the impact that their managers would have on their motivation. And it turns out the uh, manager's support has 3x the impact that any individual on the team. So you can find the right people for your team, the best people, the most competent, the most autonomous and mission-driven people ever, the managers they will have will still have a 3x impact on their motivation. And if this didn't uh, freak me out, that number was more than I needed, and so I really, really needed to understand this. So this was the question I asked myself back then. What do I need to do to motivate my team? How does a manager motivate someone else? What's the secret? So this is what this talk is about, and exploring intrinsically motivated teams through the manager's toolbox. Here's what we're going to talk about. First, I'll do a short introduction on one of the most robust and supported um, uh, theories of human motivation. And then we'll look at a use case, and we'll talk about uh, the winner of 2019's Manager of the Year Award. We'll would explore what is it that this manager does that deserves such an award. But first, let's start with chapter one, self-determination. What? Self-determination theory. This is the work of two American psychologists, Edward D.C. and um, Richard Ryan. In 2000, they published a pa this paper um, titled Self-Determination Theory and the Facilitation of Intrinsic Motivation, Social Development, and Well-Being. Those things are all connected, and I really highly recommend everyone here uh, to read this paper. If you haven't heard of self-determination theory, maybe you've seen this TED talk by Dan Pink called The Puzzle of Motivation, or maybe you've read his book, Drive. This is self-determination theory. Or maybe you've seen other talks uh, on player motivation and motivation of people and interactive experiences. And a lot of great research has been done on this topic to understand the, mo the motivational pool of video games. This also is inspired by self-determination theory. Or maybe you've heard about um, those, term, those terms, intrinsic motivation and extrinsic motivation. Self-determination theory emerged from the research on intrinsic and extrinsic motivation uh, back in 1971, where Edward D.C. was the first psychologist to do experiments with human subjects. Back then, most psychologists believed that motivation was a quantity, something you have enough of to do something or not enough of to do something. But D.C. and Ryan had a different perspective. They believe quality to be um, a continuum of different quality of motivation rather than a quantity. 
And since this talk is not uh, titled Extrinsically Motivated Teams, you've guessed it, intrinsic motivation leads to better outcomes. Uh, but in order to facilitate intrinsic motivation, um, SDT stipulates that three basic psychological needs need to be satisfied. This is our need for competence, for autonomy, and for relatedness. Competence is our need to seek to control the outcome and to experience mastery in everything we do. This is about um, seeking novelty and getting better at something you find meaningful. Autonomy is to be a causal agent of one's own life, which means to have meaningful choices about the things you do and the way you do them, but also to act in harmony um, with one's integrated self, which means to do something with full volition, doing something that you'd happily endorse because it aligns with your personal values and beliefs. Note that here autonomy does not mean independence, because this is about having autonomy within the wider group, which leads us to our third basic psychological need, relatedness. Relatedness is our need to interact, be connected to, and experience caring for others. This is about being part of a community, a family, or a team of people you care for and who care for you, and together you have a shared purpose. So these are the three basic psychological needs identified by self-determination theory. Competence, autonomy, and relatedness. Over the years, they've been shown to be innate, things that we are born with, rather than things that are learned through life experiences. They've been also shown to be universal, true of all humans. Hands up who has humans on their teams. So you should all think of them. They all have those three basic, basic psychological needs, and so do you. So when you think about motivation in your own, think about those three facets. Are you satisfied in terms of competence, autonomy, and relatedness? Are you learning something new? Do you have autonomy about the choices that you make? And do you understand the meaning of the work that you do? You can be super passionate about something and then suddenly be disengaged. Usually it tracks back to one of those uh, tenets of motivation being um, underrepresented, under-supported. 50 years of academic studies, both in the lab and in the field, have shown that extrinsic motivators, uh, money, promotion, fame, things like this, can have a negative impact on work that requires creativity and pro uh, problem solving, anything that requires even rudimentary cognitive skill. On the other end, intrinsic motivation has been shown to not only provide better results, better performance in work that requires cognitive skills, which is exactly the type of work that we do every day, but has also shown that to have a positive impact on people's well-being, and thus um, decreasing the level of uh, burnout in, in teams uh, over 50, more than 50 uh, studies in the last 30 years. And also for teams, it shows that there's, it tends to, be a, to lead to lower turnover rates in, in teams that are intrinsically motivated by the work that they do. So to recap on self-determination theory, Know that it's a macro theory of human motivation. It encapsulates, encapsulates a lot of different uh, aspects of research in the last 50 years in the, under this one umbrella. It has emerged from the research on extrinsic and intrinsic motivation and considered motivation to be a quality, a continuum of quality um, that leads to different um, outcomes. And intrinsic motivation is the one that is, has been shown to lead to better outcomes in our, in our line of work as it not only um, impacts performance, but also well-being, and is facilitated when three innate, universal basic psycho psychological needs um, are satisfied. And those are competence, autonomy, and relatedness. Now, I'm going to stop here for the theory, but I think it's a fascinating topic on which we can spend hours and hours. I know I did. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to talk about this offline um, after the talk if you're interested to know more. But for now, we're going to talk about uh, what we all want to be one day as manager of the year. So who could be our manager of the year 2019? Is it one of those corporate CEOs? It could be. They are all remarkable in their own ways, and there's a lot to learn from them. A lot of articles and books are written about uh, them every year. They're quite uh, inspiring. 
but I always find it uh, hard to kind of um, um, compare my daily work uh, to their context, and thus finding inspiration in the things I read about um, uh, those um, uh, CEOs. So I'm looking for something that's closer to the type of work I do, working with 10 to 20 people every day, maybe 30 if you start looking at uh, teams uh, slightly um, beyond the teams you're working with directly. So I want to talk about this gentleman. Raise your hand if you know who that is. OK, lower your hand if you're a, <laughs> a football fan. OK, this is the football manager. This is Jurgen Klopp. He is the manager of Liverpool FC. And he is the uh, best manager of 2019 for the FIFA men's team. Now, disclaimer, I'm not a football fan, nor am I um, a, um, a fan of uh, Liverpool in particular. This is not why I chose this example. What I'm interested in understanding with someone who works in a context where the number of teams and the impact of creativity and also enabling others to do good work is closer to what I do every day, what can science teach us about the reason why that team is particularly uh, performing this year? In particular, what I'm interested in understanding is Liverpool is a great club, but it has the, um, uh, access to the same financials and same um, talents that everyone else, and yet that team stand out uh, last year and is doing pretty well this year as well. So let's explore what this manager does. First, you need to know that Jürgen Klopp is, is known for the range of emotions that he shows on the pitch. <laughs> he's quite a colorful character, and he's also known for the uh, personal and very close relationship he has with his players. But he's also known for a close um, relationship he has with uh, the supporters. <laughs> Wouldn't it be great to be doing this every morning coming into work? How's everyone doing? <laughs> anyway, this thing will not translate to your daily work. The rest uh, is more likely. But still, it's pretty cool. But most importantly, he is known for the incredible results that a team has and the performance they've shown last year. So out of 56 games across all competitions in, in 2019, only six losses, 43 wins. And is the first English club to have won the international treble of Champions League, Super Cup, and, and the Club World Cup. It's, it's a once-in-a-lifetime um, achievement from a team that always had access to the same talents and the same budget and same equipment as everyone else, as they've done for the last 10 years. And yet, it's this manager that makes a big difference. We know that intrinsic motivation does uh, deliver better performance. So if intrinsic motivation and the intrinsic motivation to win is how we can explain their performance, then surely we should be able to look at the way Jurgen Klopp manages his team and also cross-reference how he supports competence, autonomy, and relatedness. Now, before we dig into this, I'm going to change the pictures because this is unfair to who that person is. He has a great smile, so it's much better uh, to look at this. So we go we're going to look at three short clips where he talks about how he manages his team, and we're trying to reference this back to those three basic psychological needs and see if science can explain us what's happening there, because I don't know anything about football. I have a lot more information than I give to the players, and not because I don't want to, I want to keep that, no, just because I want they have to play a football game, and football is a game, and you have to play that with freedom. In the beginning, for example, when a new player is coming in, I don't give them any information. It's like let them play, let's learn that I learn about him, what he's doing naturally, and what we want to adjust, and what we want to leave with him, and what we want to stop him doing, and stuff like that. So you learn more about your players each day, and then you know how to how to treat them, how to deal with them. A lot happens in the one-one talk, actually, but that's with the player and with the team. There are more things to do, and they're then all in the right shape and in the right position. And you try to, yeah, to help eleven players to do the right things in the right moment. Actually, I love how he looks at the floor and he says, "You have to make eleven people do the right thing." <laughs> it's so hard, and yet this is um, something that we we come across every day. So let's look at the things he mentioned in, in this video. So first, he talks about giving people and, the, and his uh, new members of the team 
on board properly, figure out how they fit in the, the wider group, get into the role that they're supposed to, um, to be uh, playing for the rest of the team, but also feel competent about, yes, I can do the job I'm, I'm supposed to do, to give them time to understand that. He also talks about sharing the right information. So when you have someone coming on a team, you can either be fully transparent, give them access to all the information that you have, but you risk um, overwhelming them with information to a point where they cannot make a decision without your input anymore, which is not really a way to get them autonomous. But if you give them just enough information so they can act autonomously and don't require you for the key pieces of information that will lead to a meaningful decision, then you are supporting their autonomy. He talks about understanding each member of the team. Obviously, if you are to provide people with um, meaningful choices, you need to understand their perspective, where they're coming from, how they see things, so you can give them information um, from a different context that will either complement their view or just help them make a decision. And he also separates talking to individuals and taking care of them from taking care of the team. There are two different entities. If you are to manage um, a team um, and don't consider the, the wider group, you're missing part of the interactions. But if you as a manager put things in the perspective of the team with every individual on your team, you help foster those connections and show that you value the relatedness of your team and every member and how they connect to each, one, um, uh, each of the members of the team. And finally, this is the end goal, obviously, of autonomy, is to enabling others to make decisions, not becoming a bottleneck, however it is, to information or decision making, uh, to foster people's autonomy. Let's look at another clip. All of what we do in life, how I understand, is about relationship. Because otherwise you live in a forest alone, on a mountain alone, and if you only want to be alone and want to be responsible for exactly the things you do and no responsibility for anything else, you have to live alone. Otherwise, always when you enter a room, you, you have a little bit of responsibility at least for the mood in the room. There's a football team, we have to. We have to work really close together. Each player knows each name of each person who works at Melbourne. It's not me to create an atmosphere. Every, each person in a room, each person is responsible for that, and a football team uh, especially. It worked out well. We all win for each other meanwhile. We, we do it for our, for Carol and Caroline. We do it because we know how important it is to them, and um, that makes it just more valuable, more worthy. It's just, it feels different. If you have a bigger group to do it for, the more the better it feels for yourself. That's how it is. So here he talks about relationships. So obviously it, it has a huge impact on relatedness, of course. Um, so it's understanding how everyone plays a role and impact the other people in the team. Those connections and how your mood on a particular day will have an impact on other people. Just like if you're really positive and really confident in, in getting something done, you will get other people to feel the same way. Fear, on the other hand, is contagious. If you're freaking out about something and you're the manager, that's probably a, a good um, uh, thing for other people to be freaking out about the same thing. So being conscious of this and projecting that it is important to think about how you're impacting the rest of the team is quite key. He talks about knowing everyone personally. So this is not just about him knowing them, it's people knowing each other quite well. Again, understanding other people's perspective, not just the manager with their reports, but also everyone on the team. This is a key thing, of course, if you want to foster close collaboration. You are more likely, um, uh, and this is, again, uh, supported by a lot of um, research uh, studies on this, you're more likely to give away some of your comfort if it's in the, um, in the, for the gain of someone you know cl uh, closely. Knowing someone, their, their name, the, their family, or any other aspects of their personal life will make you more likely um, uh, to make concessions. Which at the end of the day, working in really complex projects across many, many teams, you have to give something for the bigger goal um, and not defend necessarily your, your own um, uh, gain. So this is another way to foster close uh, collaboration. Which in, then leads for something that he is, has been bringing to Liverpool quite a lot. Um, there's a lot of articles and videos on, on this, how he has put the, those star players, players who have been trained to think about their career and their personal gain um, in the long run, to think about how they're supporting the team. So he mentions Carol and Caroline. 
there are two cooks who work at Melwood, and they've been there for years. They've been there way before he came or any of the players came, and they'll be there long after they're gone. Uh, so it's putting yourself in the service of others. That is another great way to satisfy people's need for uh, relatedness and the connections they have to, with other people. Now, let's look at uh, one last clip. I try everything to be as successful as possible. I live 100% for the boys, with the boys, what we do for the club and all that stuff. And I think that's leadership in the first case. As, as a leader, you cannot be the, the, the last who comes in and the first who goes out, that's how it is. You have, don't have to be always the first coming in or the last going out, that's um, not by like this, but you have to be an example as well. That's how it is. You have enough confidence and that's very important for a leader because confidence, if I would expect from myself that I know everything and I'm the best in everything, I couldn't have confidence, but I don't expect, expect that. I, I know I'm good in a couple of things, really good in a few things, and um, that's enough. What I can do, my confidence is big enough that I can really let people grow next to me. It's no problem. I need experts around me. It's really, really very important that you're empathic, that you, that you try to understand the people around you, and that you give real support to the people around you. And then everybody can act, and that's what leadership is. Have strong people around you with a better knowledge in different departments than yourself. Don't act like you know everything. Be ready to admit that I have no clue in the moment, so give me a couple of minutes then I will have a clue probably. And that's exactly how I understand it, but it's not a real philosophy, it's just my way of life. So, um, in this video, what he talks about is leading by example, essentially showing other people what good looks like, helping them to understand how to get better, which is a typical um, imitation learning technique, right, that we all know. Um, and again, having confidence goes back to what I mentioned earlier. Showing other people in the team that they are able to get the goal, to achieve the goal they all set for themselves, is, has been shown to have a huge impact, obviously, on the, on the, the uh, probability that the outcome will be positive is believing you are able to do it. Um, and also being quite transparent about both your strengths and weaknesses. As a manager, showing that this is okay to not be perfect and to have uh, room to grow in different areas and, and uh, benefiting from training is a great sign sending to other people who might think I have a weakness. I, can I actually express it openly to my manager? I'm going, am I going to have a negative impact on my uh, performance review or anything else if I talk about this now? Or will I get actual support from my manager and, and potentially the training that I need? As a manager, showing that it's okay to have those because you have them as well will make everyone uh, more comfortable sharing those. And essentially, this is how you can enable other people to grow. And he talks about how you want other people to be able to do things better than you do in different areas. Again, he is not a football player. He cannot stand on the pitch and play instead of his players. So all he can do is help others make decisions, but eventually helping them uh, grow, get, become a better player, leading to better performance. He talks about having empathy, understanding other people. Again, this is about uh, putting yourself in other people's shoes, understanding their perspective, helping, them, um, help, helping provide them with meaningful choices to them. Um, this supports autonomy. But not just by letting everyone do whatever they like or how they want to do things, uh, giving the proper context, and then actively supporting their exploration and figuring out the best way to achieve something uh, and give them the feedback they need along the way. This is what gi uh, giving real support is about. And you see here in just three short clips, we can see how a range of different things he does uh, nicely support both competence, autonomy, and also relatedness um, in just under three minutes. This is something I do for myself as a manager quite often, asking myself when I'm, uh, I'm about to do something or in the way I communicated something or a process I want to use, I ask myself this question. Am I supporting competence, autonomy, and relatedness? Or am I creating barriers that will limit my team's autonomy? And also, I think this is something that is some, um, not a checkbox. It's not a list that you can magically complete and then one day uh, you get better results. If we look at the results that the Liverpool team has had, He's not a new manager. He's been with that team for over three seasons. And for the first three years, doing exactly what he's been doing all his career, there was no major impact on performance. And then over time, the team started to get better as a group and is now uh, one of the best teams in the league. Yes, the, last week they've had their first uh, loss of the season and it was, it was um, newsworthy. 
It was so surprising that they were losing a game um, because they are at a point where no one understands what is their secret and how they could be beaten and what's the thing that uh, gets them all together. Another thing that's quite unique is that they didn't win a single title in three seasons. This is unique in, the, uh, in football because most of the time the manager would have been um, uh, fired after a season or, or two at best. Here I think that if he is a good manager to his team, he also has good managers who have given him the space and the autonomy to explore different ways of uh, growing his team, who understand that you need patience and, and, and take the time for things to get in place. And I think it's, uh, again, those connections of things that make the team perform in the end. Um, and it was interesting to me from a game developer's perspective to think about this as most projects in the games industry who start, they're really complex, it takes a lot of time to get anything fun or anything on screen, and then suddenly at the end, every piece comes together. This is just a kind of anecdote, but interestingly, the CEO of Liverpool comes from the games industry and was the CEO of Electronic Arts and the head of EA Sports. So to close on human motivation and trying to answer that question I asked myself many years ago, what do I need to do to motivate my team? What I've learned through the study of human motivation is I wasn't asking myself the right question. Instead, I should have been asking myself how me as a manager, or actually anyone on the team, can help facilitate your team's intrinsic motivation, create an environment and the conditions where they will be intrinsically motivated. It's not something that you will give them, it's something you can facilitate, which eventually means doing the things that will support their need for competence, for autonomy, and relatedness. Or this uh, research on on motivation shows is that happy game developers make happy gamers. It's not just a saying. Eventually, it's, it's just science. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>